Hello, everyone. I'm Cameron Bailey, and I want you to stay home tonight with me and Ethan Hawke. Uh, this is Stay at Home Cinema, brought to you by TIFF and Crave. I'm the artistic director and co-head at TIFF. I'm glad you're here with us. And we're going to watch Richard Linklater's classic romance Before Sunrise, starring Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy. And in a moment, he'll be logging on from his home to join us. We're going to start watching the movie at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It's 4.30 on the West Coast, of course. And we're going to live tweet it as we watch. And across Canada, we're watching On Crave. Before we begin, we always want to do some shout outs just to recognize where we are and the people who uh, we're connected to. Uh, first to all Indigenous storytellers from coast to coast to coast and their communities, to all levels of government, the government of Canada, the government of Ontario and the city of Toronto right now. A lot of government workers are working very hard uh, to help keep us on our feet. Uh, not talking about TIFF here, but all of us across the country, thanks to them all frontline work workers we want to thank and i want to shout out tonight everyone living and working at long-term care homes across the country going through especially difficult times so thank you for everything you're doing if you're working in those homes and um and to the families of those people who are living in those homes as well uh, we want to thank the, the organizations that make everything we do at TIFF possible, beginning with our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa. And we want to thank the individual donors and members who've been supporting TIFF for 45 years almost. Thank you for all of your help. And now we want to talk a little bit about Before Sunrise. Uh, people fall in love with this movie. And it seems to be a love that really lasts. It's uh, celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, launched at the Sundance Film Festival in 1995, immediately became a kind of a rite of passage for so many young lovers. Um, a whole generation, I think, figured out what attraction was and longing and loss from watching this movie and living with these characters, Jesse and Celine. Of course, it was followed by Before uh, Sunset in 2004 and then in 2013, Before Midnight, kind of forming a, a perfect trilogy of romance as it matures. People do want this series to continue, though, so I'm going to ask Ethan Hawke about that in a bit. Ethan Hawke has worked with, with Richard Linklater over those three movies and, uh, again, on Boyhood. Uh, he has a career that goes all the way back to films like Gattaca, which we premiered in Toronto in 1997, and then also Training Day with uh, Denzel Washington, which premiered again with us in Toronto in 2001. Ethan Hawke is the director of four films of his own. He's a novelist. Uh, he's done great work on the th in the theatre, four-time Oscar nominee, and a man that in everything he does asks the big questions. We're gonna ask some questions of him right now, including questions from TIFF members and from social media. Ethan Hawke, welcome to Stay at Home Cinema. Hey, thanks for having me. That was so uh, beautifully well-spoken, all the people we're thinking about today. And it's interesting hearing you talk about the premieres of the other films. You know, Training Day premiered the couple days before September 11th. That's right. You know, and it, one, you know yeah. when you're part of a film festival as big as the Toronto International Film Festival, is it, it you think about it in terms of history like that, and it's it's a powerful moment we're living through right now. So thanks for having me. No, I'm really glad you're here. Um, we got a, a lot of questions I want to ask you about uh, before sunrise, and I know our members and and some people on social media want to have some questions too. So let's jump in. Um, you know, you've got a long history now, 25 years with this movie. You must have seen it work its magic on people over that time. Why do you think people love it so much? You know, it's a dangerous question for me to answer and not sound like a total, Is you it, know, is your uh, <laughs> But I, I'll, I'll tell you this, that when, when we were first... I had auditioned, I mean, I could tell you the whole story of how I came to the project, but I had auditioned, I got the part, and for some reason, I had a lot of people in my life, agents and different people tell me not to do the movie. Days to Confuse had just come out and was a big bomb, and I thought it was a work of staggering genius, but it didn't make any money, and it was a, it was kind of a high point of my career at that moment. Uh, Reality Bites had just come out, I mean, high point by the standards of how many offers I was getting. 
Right. You know, if, if that's your judgment call. You've been in society by then already. Yeah, and meaning that my agents had a lot of interest in me. You know, uh -huh. at that moment in my I life, see. and um, and they were, were people were trying to talk me out of doing that movie, and I met Rick, and I and I told him, I said, you know, the script is is difficult reading, and he said this thing. He said, you know, I don't want you to worry too much about the script. I'm inviting you to be a filmmaker with me, and he said, my whole life I've gone to the movies, and there's like espionage movies and helicopter and shootouts and, you know, all this action, everything that I see is all this drama that you would think that my life, our lives have no drama. And, and yet that's not the way I feel. Mm -hmm. My life feels very exciting to me. And I've never been involved in a gunfight or a helicopter chase or, you know, a speed boat, you know, through the, canals of venice i mean you know but but my life is still really interesting and i he said and i thought about what is it the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me really and he said it's connecting with another human being mm -hmm. and i said i want to make a movie about connection you know and 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 what that's really like and if we could put that on screen i think people would care and he said and that's not something i can script out perfectly Mm -hmm. I need to invite two actors and I need you to help me cultivate a connection and put it on screen. And when he said that, I remember thinking, yeah, I want to see that movie. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that is the most exciting thing when you, you know, it, it can happen in a lot of ways, but when you have some kind, when someone touches your heart and they get, get through all the barriers you put up or all the neuroses you have or all the, confident, whatever walls you've created, and somebody navigates through that and they touch you, you feel like that's why you were born, you yeah. know, for this moment to experience mm -hmm. it. And, and so that was our challenge with that first film. That, the, the challenge was that high to Rick, you know, um, he, he had just had a, an interesting experience with his own methodology on Days of Confused for people that are fans of that movie. You know, he, he had, that movie was created out of an intense rehearsal process. But he was, I don't think he'd mind me saying, he was really disappointed with himself in how much better he did with the men than the women. Hmm. That, the, that the feeling he had ultimately when he was finished with Daisy Confused was that it was a boy movie. That at, at a, it, its focus in the male characters, it didn't achieve the Chekhovian goal, you know, of, of being genderless. Mm -hmm. And his goal for Before Sunrise was to invite a very strong woman, you know, and, and invite these two, and male and female, and let them kind of create their characters together so that the, the movie felt genderless, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, like God's POV, not, you know, most not of the, when you see, yeah, when, right. when you see romances, they're either these romances that like the boyfriend gets dragged to and he rolls his eyes because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, a chick flick or whatever, or it's, you know, got Eva Mendes crawling over a Trans Am or something, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and the girls are rolling their eyes like, what is this? Right. Yeah. And, and so Rick's dream was to like, I want to make a romance that men like and women like. And, and that's the secret that we're talking about. That's what I, I think, I think that's the answer to your question. Right. Okay. Um, there's a, somebody named Bella on Twitter who asked a question I want to know as well, which is, what do you think clicked between you and Julie Del P to give Jesse and Celine this incredible chemistry? You know, chemistry as an actor is, uh, sometimes it's really not there and it doesn't matter what tricks you pull out of your back pocket. It, I remember um, my screen test with Denzel, like, I thought, oh, I'm going to get this part, you know. I mean, the, the, we had chemistry together. And, mm -hmm. and Julie and I, we did our screen test together. I, I say that meaning that I feel it when it happens. And I'm not exactly sure what it is. Mm -hmm. Julie, at that point in her life, ready, she'd already worked with Goddard. She'd yeah. already worked with Kislowski. She yeah. worked with Volker Schlondorf. She was, I don't know, 23 and ferociously intelligent. You know, you know, I mean, uh, and <laughs> you know, she would, 
I, I've never felt so stupid in my whole life as talking to her. Just because she made she just made you she made you feel like a big dumb American guy. You, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. you know, the second I would bring up football or something, she'd roll her eyes. <laughs> you know, and, and um but that's part of that spark as well, though, right? Because you feel that you're coming from different worlds, and that difference is part of what what connects you. Somewhere. And and you know, the, some of the credit has to be to Rick too, because you know he always says he wasn't going to make the movie if he didn't find the right two people. And you know, he didn't care when I first got the script. For example, um, it was set in San Antonio. It was uh, um, like a a foreign guy traveling across America and mm. running into an American woman or so. I, oh, <laughs> none, totally of the, none of the details like that mattered. It mattered who the people were to, to Rick. Right. You know, that, that they, I mean, meaning that I think if he'd found, he didn't have an agenda, like it has to be a French actress. It has right. to be, is it? It's once he had Julie and I, um, he started constructing it for that narrative, you mm. know? And, and I think that worked out well because, you know, Rick and I are both, from Texas and we had a simpatico that I could kind of become his right arm. And then Julie had a totally different background than the two of us. Mm -hmm. And unlike a lot of directors who try to have power over people and dictate things and direct them and Rick invites, just invited her to contribute. Mm -hmm. You know, w w tell me about Celine. Tell me, I mean, he let us name our characters. I mean, it was a really fun first day rehearsal. He was like, what are your characters' names? You know, we talked about what it would mean and why, and and he really let us create our characters from scratch like that. Why did you choose Jesse for your character's name? Um, mostly because I I had always been embarrassed about the name Ethan when I was growing up. You know, I just I didn't think it sounded like a you know kids want to be just like everybody else. Right. I mean, it's, and Ethan was a very uncommon name when I was growing up. I never met another Ethan. And, and uh, I don't know, until I was some much older. And uh, I was just always embarrassed by it. And when I was a kid, I really I had a cousin named Jesse mm -hmm. and Jesse Hawk. And I always I was like, why can't I be Jesse? And um, and and Julie made fun of me that I just want to be like Jesse James. She's like, you're so American. You want to be an outlaw. You want to be Jesse James. And, and Rick was like, let's put that in the script. You know, and, and so I say, my name's Jesse, like Jesse James. And, um, and so it, it's just a little in joke. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Rick picked, we didn't even have to come up. We never, we didn't have to have last names for our characters until the second film when, when I, I'm writing a book in the second film and we needed the author jacket. And Rick right. was like, yeah. what's his last name? <laughs> um, here's a question from Talene Bratanian, is a TIFF member. She says, before Sunrise is part of a trilogy, trilogy that was filmed over the course of almost a decade and Boyhood was filmed over 12 years, what are the challenges and what are the joys for the actors when so much time passes between the shoots? Yeah, you know, before the before trilogy happens over, um, it's more than much more than a decade. Uh, it's uh, what is it? I'm doing the math right now. It's 27 years. Like it's 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 a long time. Um, well, it's nine years. No, 18 years. Sorry, 18. Um, and we made them at the same time. You know, we started shooting Boyhood uh, right around the time that either right before before. Sunset or right after? I guess it was right after. Um, trying to remember. Yeah, yeah, I think it was right after. Anyway, um, so we we were making them at the same time, and mm -hmm. I liked. I often make this joke that those, the before trilogy and Boyhood, the main character of both those films is time. You know yes. that that time is this overwhelming uh, force that is. You know, most movies rely on narrative. You know, they have a plot, and that's what pushes them forward. And those four movies really use time as the engine. It's just this clock, the clock of, you know, getting older, the clock that we're all living under that we completely ignore all the time. Mm -hmm. I love this thing of, you know, that what's fascinating about an illness or a pandemic like we do is like, you know, it's, it's just a reminder all the time that disease and death is always a part of our life. We're all going to die. We, we, and we, we choose not to think about it so we can move on. It means we can get something done with our day, but 
I think that those movies are very aware. Even when we were making the first one, there was an awareness of the temporariness of our youth. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Rick, we were really careful not to put any pop culture references mm -hmm. in the movie. Oh, yeah, and we, we really wanted the movie to age. Like it could have been in the 60s, it could be in the, one thing we couldn't have predicted is phones. You know, the one thing that's really dramatically different uh, is that now if this were happening, they would have their phone and the decision not to call each other uh, would be a much bigger decision. I mean, not, yeah. to, not to share emails or find the person on Instagram or whatever, you know, that's a very different decision now. And, huh. um, but yet people can do that kind of thing. I mean, we were just super, super aware of trying to be outside of uh, the trappings of time. And mm -hmm. that is one of the beauties of Europe, you know, is you're very aware of the generations and generations and generations and generations that have lived before you. You're walking over all amidst that. Yeah. Uh, on that, that subject of time, there's another question from Salem Alaton, a TIFF member, saying this is half your, half your lifetime ago when you made Before Sunrise. Is the way that you relate to that character, Jesse, different today than it was then? You know, I mean, I think, I don't know if other people feel this way, but the biggest shocking element of growing older to me is how much I feel like the same person. I, I, I think I, I imagined that I would, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm going to turn 50 in a couple of months, right? And I feel so close to that young man that made that movie that people are going to watch tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, you know, uh, OJ driving down the highway and we stopped rehearsal to watch it on the news. I remember the Knicks losing to Houston and Julie interrogating me about why I cared. Why, would you, care? why, why would you waste a second of your life? You don't know those men. <laughs> Why do you care? I'm like, no, Patrick, I'm it's really hurting. Healthy approach to sports. I love that. And and so I don't know. I, I think that I feel because it's kind of been a life project for so long, I can't help it. But during this pandemic, imagine how Jesse and Celine would be. Like sometimes I think, you know, when people ask all the time, are, would, are we going to make another one or whatever? I have this imagination of like, like, well, wouldn't it be amazing to see Jesse and Celine, you know, I, I first had the idea actually watching all those beautiful videos of people in Italy and how they were hurting and playing the trumpet out their yeah. windows. And, and I could picture Jesse and Celine in an apartment like that, just talking and talking and talking and, you know, trapped in some hotel room in Italy or something. That's a, mm -hmm. I, uh, I could picture that. But so I'm, I'm constantly thinking, I remember when, um, I first, you know, I had perfect sight my whole life. I was always proud of my hawk eyes, right? You know, and like, and all of a sudden, you know, boom, I need glasses. Yeah. And you see, this is a pandemic is that I, I, I broke my glasses. I can't <laughs> <remember. Yeah. laughs> uh, And anyway, but I remember when I was, went for my optometrist, you know, exam, optometrist, whatever the right word is there uh, for the exam. I remember thinking, oh, wow. So if there's another before movie, then Jess, Jesse's getting glasses too. It's like this right. parallel life. I'm like, what would Jesse say about getting glasses? What does this mean to us? And, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, and I, I, you know, Julie is always so funny about sickness and death. And she would say something absolutely hysterical. And so I, <laughs> I, I really, I'm sure you always, she was the one doing this Q and A because. Oh, no, we just want to see you together again. Yeah, no, I know. We want to be together again. Making them, come on. It's a, uh, it's a funny. I always think about what Jesse would think about X or Y when it happens to me. Hmm. All right, last question. This one's for me. There are going to be people out there who are watching Before Sunrise for the very first time tonight, and especially if you're young and you're going through similar things. What do you want people to look for? What do you want them to know before they start watching Before Sunrise for the first time? One of the reasons why I'm doing this Q&A tonight and why I feel so proud over these 25 years of this movie, uh, for this movie is, is um, there was a moment in rehearsal when Julie said, 
Rick, this movie is going to be so boring. It's just these two people talking. We need to get some jokes. We should call a professional joke writer and get them to contribute jokes. It's not funny. It's so boring. And, and Rick said, um, Julie, I've been in this hotel room writing this movie with you for four weeks. And I have never been bored. It's 12, 14 hours a day. And I haven't been bored for one second. And if we could put you, all that is you on screen, then no one will be bored. And if they are, they can go to hell. <laughs> you, you know? Um, and, and really what he's saying there is that we are enough. It's a very hard thing for us to as people to comprehend is that we are interesting. We have something to say. We are valuable, every one of us, you know? And it, it's really only our posturing that makes us boring and cliche, hmm. you know? And, and I hope that young people see this movie and know that they are enough, you know, that they, who they are, you don't have to be. You're special from the moment you were born. It sounds corny and everything like that, but it's at its essence, what the movie is, when it talks about connection and love and people, people simply witnessing each other, that that has a huge power if it's the real you, you know? Um, and that I, I hope that, you know, I think that <clears throat> the same way that, you know, sometimes I leave Harry Potter or Avatar or Star Wars and I just get a little blue because my own life, like I'm not blue and I don't give superpowers and I don't, you know, and, and, um, <clears throat> but I think Rick's movies make you realize that w your life is magic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Beautifully put. Thank you. Well, Ethan, thank you so much. We're going to start watching, get your snacks ready, you. whatever you need to do ready. 7.30 PM Eastern. We're going to press play on before sunrise. We'll be live tweeting it. We're using the hashtag Tiff at Home. Ethan Hawk, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, man. Really enjoyed talking to you. Me too. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.